how do we how do we bring those people not in the camp um, and say this is this is what is good for women and I say this in terms of what is good for Māori is good for New Zealand. So what is good for women is good for New Zealand. What's good for men is good for New Zealand. So you know it's about getting people on that waka to be able to have that conversation, in my view. Mm. And I don't think we can do it without men, mm. um, actually. And so I said I was really proud of our. Um, executive board of 100 years ago who decided that this was a priority and I think if we look at the suffragette movement there were a lot of men who yes. helped that move through as well and I'm um, heartened when I look at the white ribbon campaign mm -hmm. and at the male champions in that. Yeah. Um, I'm a co-national secretary with a man and he speaks about equal pain the same way I do mm -hmm. and he's as passionate about it as I am and I, I find that really heartening. I just think we need much, much more of that and I'm still in environments um, now with with powerful men in meetings who talk about the gender wage gap as though it's some kind of a, um, anomaly that the, th the free market has just thrown up. That it's not at all about a gender-based <laughs> discrimination. <laughs> Absolutely, it, it's almost as though if you talk about this in, the, in terms of being a gender issue, that quite frightened. And, that, and I want to see that attitude change. I want us to be able to speak about equal pay and talk about it as being gender-based discrimination and have everybody go, yeah, yeah. it is, mm -hmm. it is. Which is um, then when they start, they stop breaking the law, maybe. Yeah, mm -hmm. social injustice and social unfairness is crosses colours, creed, age. It's just social injustice. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there was an issue in my um, sector <laughs> about this, Rachel, recently, Rachel Smalley, um, commenting that you know there were too many white straight men on um, you know on the radio. She was talking about Radio New Zealand, mm -hmm. um, but you could, that could be extended to the media in general. And there's been a, a big debate about it in the, in the few days that followed. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Do we need more visible women in the media? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, it's a, that comment I made before about seeing yourself in leadership roles. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think um, if you're only hearing a particular voice and you're only seeing a particular form of leadership, mm -hmm. then your perception of where you fit into society is altered. Mm -hmm. so it's also got, mm -hmm. you know, economic impact because we, I don't know, but I think we probably all know in this room that diversity, you know, is what drives innovation and different ways of thinking. Now, mm -hmm. if you've got, you know, um, a space where you've got <laughs> a certain colour, a certain uh, cultural perspective, and you're lacking that, you know, we stagnate. And so it's really bad economically for our country. To, to be like that in any workplace, and it's not, not just in the media, obviously, and it's great that there's something like Māori TV with a different reo and kaupapa and perspective. Um, yeah. and I mean, we all know the power that the media wields, for better or for worse, um, and so to have just one version of um, one narrative identifying there's a number of different narratives within that one, but, but that, you know, that's not beneficial for New Zealand. It's just not. Okay, any other questions from the audience? Yeah, so, so it's a difficult question. Can you talk about the um, gender pay gap? Do you derive that from comparing the same job between men and women, or is it an average of, say, everyone in an organisation in an office context from CE yeah. to, say, support staff, and you find the main? Uh, the main? So how do you um, the ones that I used were from Prue Hyman's research, she's an economist and um, she is far better at this stuff than me, so what I'll do is I'll give you a link to her research, but the other measure we use is from the um, HRC survey that the State Services Commission publishes, which is able to be um, found online as well, um, and that's, uh, they, they give a 14 0.1% wage gap overall in the public sector and then in the, inside that report break it down by occupational groupings inside of the state sector. Um, so I'm, I'm not an economist, I can't answer anymore but I can point you in the right direction. So yeah. It's partly about holding a number of things constant and still having a big gap. That, that's the, that's the yeah. bit that yeah. sticks in your core. Mm. Yeah and uh, I'm, I'm really reluctant sometimes to get into all of the numbers because there are so many ways you can cut it up, you know, yeah. um, and there are ways you can make it look atrocious, you know, so yeah. or ways you can make it look very minimal, but the issue is yeah. we still have a, a gender-based pay disparity yeah. in this country no matter which way you slice it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, there was an interesting um, study that came out from ANZ um, a little while ago that that disparity has 
huge <coughs> leaps at the end when you retire. <coughs> Over your life of your career, women <coughs> earn on average six hundred thousand less mm -hmm. than men, and that has, a, you know, with uh, the baby boomers retiring, that has broader impacts on women live longer, but they've got less retirement savings. Um, there are actually, you know, it's not just the money you take home every week. There are broader impacts of, of that um, disparity in, in wages. Um, I think it's about sixty thousand dollars less on average for a woman at, when she hits retirement. Yeah, at this moment. And so, she's yeah. living she's living longer than her husband generally. So um, mm. that's, a, that's a problem. Yeah. So it accumulates the, the gap has a cumulative effect. Mm. Anyway. This quote from William Fulbright has the words empathy and perception in it, which made me got me thinking. How do you get men in the positions of power in institutions, be they judicial, political, business? How do you get the men to understand that their institutions are built and operate in a way which gives privilege to men? Mm -hmm. And I'm in the legal profession, and after one year of women cream all the statistics at law school, mm -hmm. after one year of working in a law firm, men are already earning more than women. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And I actually struggle to see it myself, but it's there. Anyway, mm -hmm. empathy and perception. Any, any Do you have an answer? I mean, you're, it would be really interesting to hear a man's perspective. You're a man. For, <laughs> you tell us why you left. How would we affect if, if change if you were a CEO or somebody in an office? What would what would we have to do to convince you to make change that oh, would be lasting? I'm convinced what I would like <laughs> is examples of things to change in institutions mm -hmm. because they, they're hard to see that are giving privilege to men. And I can think of a couple of, only a couple of examples in my career where female colleagues have pointed it out to me and I've gone, oh, oh thank you. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, um, because you're never on the receiving end of it, it's mm -hmm. very hard to see. Mm -hmm. So, so my suggestion would be um, to find those things, call them out, and say this is what needs to change. Mm -hmm. the, I um, agree. Oh so it's every, sorry, sorry. I'll just say because it, it's also the same with bullying and all sorts of discrimination. Whenever there are instances which is, you know, gender unfair or everything, every single time it's ongoing for women, but we always have to say it. We always have to make say it wherever we are in our river. We always have to make a point. And it gets exhausting, I think, for some oh, people. Yeah, sure. But it's, you know, um, I, I'm a believer that you're so right, because change, truly, changing the people's minds around us, and if we see our boss every day, or boss's boss, whatever, that's permanent change. I think that's a lifetime and a generational change, as opposed I know it's a different way of from protesting outside because we, if we've got the law and the things aren't changing, then that's the permanent change, is the human change and the changing of the minds. Mm -hmm. I think there's two things from your comment, one about kind of the empathy but the other about the structural stuff and I think on the empathy, um, I spoke to someone recently, um, a, a white wealthy privileged man who had been through unconscious bias training that is going around, there's a lot of mm -hmm. this happening now and he had just had his eyes completely opened by it and just said he had absolutely no idea. He was asked a question, have you ever felt in a position where you have not been felt powerful? And he could, he, he could honestly say no. And, and I just remember just thinking, that is in, insane. But you know, that was his reality. But that, that opened up his eyes a bit and I think that maybe some of that training is, is going to be really valuable. But on the structural stuff, I think we know the we can easily identify, and we've actually developed a diagnostic tool to do this, um, where the points are, where the gap starts to open, so the appointment salaries, the movements, mm -hmm. the progression, the um, childcare break, the, um, the whole bunch of them, and if you could start to cater your policy to you know, attempt to minimise the disparity at each of those key points throughout a, a career, um, then you know, structurally you can start to, to yes. fix those. So all that's missing there then is a the willingness. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting thing, I don't know, I, I, I'm just going to say it because there's an interesting psychological research that women in management and position of power kick down the younger women, the women coming up, psychologically, that, that I'm wondering whether some of that might have some sort of, I, I'm not, absolutely not blaming, but psychologically women competitive, the ones who are higher up, the, say the ladder and the hierarchy, 
kick down the other ones. It's just, it's a lot stronger than, than the men. Like it's, it's more of a struggle for women. This is American research though. Mm. Climbing up the ladder with women actually in higher positions in the organization being barriers. And I don't know whether that might impact on pay negotiations as well. So who knew unconscious bias training was a thing? <laughs> Oh, does Maybe, Deepak yeah. one here yeah. know that it's yeah. a thing? Yeah, yeah. there are some people know and that. And it's okay. about creating <laughs> that, um, just to go back to your question, Henry, because that's about creating a safe conversation. Mm. Um, and that does require a willingness to even enter into that oh, conversation, yeah. you know? So it is a generational issue as well. So, I mean, you know, we can talk about how we raise boys, um, you know, go right down to that level in terms of ensuring that we're doing, and when I say we, I mean everybody in the room, not just women, um, what we can to nurture boys into men who are comfortable to have that conversation, um, you know, looking way ahead into the future. But it is about both ensuring that there's that space to have that conversation, um, but also the willingness. Mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Can I just add also that, you know, one of the things that the example of your great grandmother shows, Horiana, is that part of the New Zealand story to the world is that the individual narrative is not the only frame. Mm -hmm. So we have a tribal narrative that's actually a collective narrative that has created a safer space for Māori women to be trailblazers and pioneers, mm -hmm. supported by their whānau hapu and iwi, mm -hmm. than perhaps some individuals enjoy. And that creative collective space is really important for us. Long before the government had Girls Can Do Anything as a policy, Māori, our tipuna, were taking very radical positions way ahead of the government policy. So we need to champion our own iwi narrative as well, because firstly it's a collective narrative but also it's been such a creative, pioneering and, and resistant narrative that the rest of the world looks to us for leadership in. Long may that continue. Mm. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Vera Anderson from the National Council of Women. One, one of the things I think we need to think about is not just equality between men and women, but think of it as terms of equality of outcome. So for instance, if you go back to how superannuation has been established, the, the model for the superannuation was based on white male and full-time employment. Mm -hmm. It didn't didn't take into account mm -hmm. that women have employment breaks because mm -hmm. of childcare rates and anything like that. So when you look at the superannuation that a woman accrues over her work time, it's quite different mm -hmm. from the superannuation level that a man accrues over his work time because the man is more likely, and I can't remember what the statistic is, but more likely to have been in full-time paid employment mm -hmm. for his entire working life. Whereas a woman is <coughs> able to only have been in employment, let alone full-time employment, for about 65 to 70 percent of her working life. Mm -hmm. So it's looking at what are the actual um, um, processes that are, are, are there and, and how they um, disenfranchise women, or mm -hmm. maybe even occasionally disenfranchise men, but that they mm -hmm. give equality of outcome. Mm -hmm. How can we do that? Any ideas? <laughs> um, well, you actually have to look at the model that yeah, you use. You have to change the structure. You change the structure. Yeah. You change the model. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, that's a, and part of that is about being brave and say, yeah. saying that there's something wrong with the structure yeah. because there just clearly is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And trying to, I mean, that's, yeah, that's difficult, but that also starts um, with these conversations, but will end up in the beehive. Yeah. Um, and so that's about ensuring also that we have people in the beehive that are open to having those conversations. The gender pay gap, if, if from looking, I don't know if other people may have a better idea, apparently shrunk down to, um, in between, is it 2008 and 12? Do you know that? It, it shrunk, oh, it shrunk down, kind of and I'm like, what that? happened then? Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened. What happened to make it shrink? Well, they were increasing the working for families mm -hmm. payments, which oh. was a big factor in bringing that together. Oh. But in the last year, the gender pay gap has grown. I think it's about 7%. So, do we have any idea of why? Sorry? Do we have any idea of why it's growing? No. Working about. Um, well, uh, the, the, the gap between the richest and the poorest is also growing. Mm -hmm. So that, that might be oh, it. Um, but also the pay and employment equity unit, which was doing work around this and sort of keeping it in people's consciousness, was disbanded. About seven years ago? So I'm sure that that has something to do with it because um, it was a very deliberate move by the then government to try to do something about it. I'm not, I'm not condoning that as being the 
the model that we must continue to pursue, but I do think that there was an attempt. Mm -hmm. And it was making a difference. Okay, um, I just realised we've gone a wee bit over time. Um, sorry about that, but it's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much. A lot of different perspectives here and um, some really alarming statistics, um, but also some ways we can um, reverse this and close this gap. So um, thank you very much to our speakers. Um, please join me.